and here they stood, all arms twined in a last communal embrace. And here they stood, all arms twined in a last communal embrace, some 40 odd survivors of the Carib tribe, men, women, small babes and toddlers in whatever proportion, no one knows the exact number. Their French pursuers clamoring at their backs, whatever fate beckoned, slaughter by musket fire, burnings at the stake, or most dreaded enslavement to those fish belly faced white men. They chase all, they chose all of one voice howl in the trade winds, the same winds as today, to die, and yes, die out in one mystic synchronized bowl leap of defiance to the naked rocks below. They knew their family, multitude of spirits, the clan oversoul would fly up while their hand clasped lean bodies gored on the horned rock pinnacles below. The scar, the, they soar into life beyond, a life forever, forever more remote from the terrible nonsense, a life forever more remote from terrible nonsense. This is adapted from a poem by Lawrence Lieberman called Carib Sleep. It is my pleasure this afternoon to welcome everyone to the 2021 Indigenous Peoples Heritage Virtual Education Forum. The theme for this evening's presentation or this afternoon's presentation is Monde Sotez, Lipa's Hill Remembrance Day and Indigenous Peoples Heritage Day, memorializing May 30th, 1650. This event is a joint collaboration of the Indigenous Peoples Heritage Support Organization, the IPE Dare to Understand Enlightenment Series and the UE Open Campus. I'm especially pleased this afternoon to welcome our distinguished panel of scholars whose presentations run the gamut from uh, the legacy of the Kalinago in Grenada to an example of maintaining indigenous people's presence on islands lost to them. We are indeed uh, in for a treat this evening of intellectual stimulation and generative conversation around indigenous heritage. We would also like to welcome our specially invited guests teachers, students, educators from all around Grenada and indeed all around the Caribbean who are here with us this afternoon. We hope that this afternoon's discussion will be the linchpin that generates a multitude of conversations, networks and uh, further discussions around the idea of preserving our indigenous heritage for ourselves now and for posterity. At this time, it is my Pleasure to introduce to you my co-moderator for this afternoon, Ms. Lana Dale Charles. And Lana Dale is, holds an MA in archaeology. She's a specialist in archaeology, in the archaeology of the Americans and Indigenous Peoples Heritage. She's an archaeologist that specializes in the heritage of the Americas and Indigenous Peoples, an educator who teaches courses in the social sciences that include the sociology of crime and deviance race and class and gender in the contemporary Caribbean. Her areas of interest are comparative and historical sociology, archeology span of history of the Sukkum Caribbean that includes human societies and cultures in the past and present. The intersection of politics, history and archeological conservation, protection of the natural and maritime cultural heritage and landscapes, archeology span and heritage and its connection to nationalism and identity. Lorna Dale received her MA in archaeology from the University of Leiden, University of Leiden in the Netherlands. Thank you, Tesfar, and welcome all to our 2021 Indigenous Peoples Heritage Virtual um, Education Forum. My co-moderator, um, Tesfa Patterson, she's currently a PhD candidate in the Department of Geography and Planning at Queen's University in Canada where she utilizes feminist methodologies to examine the intersection of gender, emotion, and the nation state in the context of Caribbean diaspora. 
In her research, she's using a range of ethnographic methods like oral history and participant observations. She's also exploring the ways in which Caribbean women produce diaspora and the ways in which these practices of diasporic formation challenges current efforts by Caribbean nation states to leverage and mobilize diasporic uh, populations. Her research also examines what kind of work or focus on emotion can do to further our collective understandings of the progressive possibilities of diaspora. Tesfa has a long history of community education and an activist both in Montreal and Canada and here in Grenada. And she believes passionately in the importance of community collaboration as a critical feature of intellectual life. She will be given the 2021 IPE and UE Open Campus Annual Commemorative Emancipation Public Lecture on the theme, The Making of the Grenadian Diaspora, Narratives of the, of the Lives of Grenadian Women in the Diaspora. And this is scheduled to take place on Monday, July 26th at Northern Hall right here in Grenada, St. George's. Uh, Tesfa, thank you for being, um, being here with us and for agreeing to do this and all the work that you would have put in. So welcome all. We have a special message from Dr. Nicole Philip Dow. She's the head of the University of the West Indies Open Campus here in Grenada. And she has served in the field of education for the past 19 years. Dr. Dow is a historian and has written and co-authored four books, including Women in Grenada in History, 1783 to 1983, Perspectives on the Grenadian Revolution, 1979 to 1983, and Caribbean Social Studies um, books two and three. She provides community service by giving lectures and oral talks on history, culture, and other related issues. So here's our message from our special guest. The University of the West Indies Open Campus Grenada is pleased to be part of this education and remembrance program. The Amerindians were the first to inhabit these Caribbean islands. They had their livelihoods and their lives ripped from them by invading Europeans, European forces whose only objective was a pursuit of wealth. While the Amerindian had a symbiotic relationship with the land, the Europeans sought to pillage, plunder, and destroy. They, the mattress who took their own lives at Sirtis Bay rather than submit to European colonization speak to the indomitable spirit of the Amerindian peoples. Today, we are thankful for the root crops of sweet potatoes and cassavas, among others, they have passed on to us. We celebrate their legacy and resilience as we join in the clarion, calling and demanding repository justice for their descendants. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce the first uh, presenter for this afternoon, John Angus Martin. And he will be delivering a presentation titled Mondesotes, Leapers Hill and Beyond, The Legacy of the Kalinago. John Angus Martin is an historian, archivist, and researcher. He's the director of the Sabre Archaeological Center. And he's also a PhD candidate in heritage management in the Faculty of Archaeology at Leiden University in the Netherlands. John Angus is an historian, archivist, and researcher, and currently serves as the director of the Sabre Archaeological Center. He is also affiliated, is an affiliated fellow of Carib Trails under Dr. Kareen Hoffman, KITLV, Leiden, the Netherlands. He is a multidisciplinary academic and has a diverse background and diverse experiences. However, he specializes in the history of colony. colony colonization and slavery in Grenada, and explores Caribbean identity and historical relationships in the archipelagic space. He is currently pursuing a PhD in heritage management in the Faculty of Archaeology at Leiden University. Looking into landscape history, representation, memory, and identity in Grenada. He has worked as the director, curator of the Grenada National Museum, and as a researcher for Nexus for the Nexus 1492 project at Leiden University. 
is the author of several books on Grenada, including A to Z of Grenadian Heritage. I highly recommend that you get that one. Island Caribs and French Settlers in Grenada. I also highly recommend that one. Co-authored with Joseph Oppola and Dr. Cynthia Schmidt, The, Tembe, the Temne Nation of Caracou, Sierra Leone's Lost Family in the Caribbean, and co-edited with Dr. Nicole Philip Dow, Perspectives on the Grenada Revolution, 1979 to 1983. Let's welcome John Angus Martin. Thank you, Tesco, for that introduction. Appreciate it. Today, Sunday, March 30th, 2021, marks the 371st anniversary of the massacre of the Kalinago and Kalina, at what became known as La Monde sur Terre, the Hill of the Jumpers, and more popularly as Leaper's Hill or Carib's Leap. I would like to share with you a brief telling of that story. I would like to share with you a brief telling of that story as best as we have been able to piece together from the limited sources available, especially after questioning the popular tale that have been woven over the centuries. I hope that I can leave you with a deeper sense of what took place that day. Consequences for the Kalinago and Kalina of Kamahorn and their legacy today. Despite the overwhelming Despite the overwhelming evidence to the contrary, the tale of extinction still dominates the narrative of the Kalinago and Kalina on Kamahorn, as the distant memory of the nocturnal ambush and massacre at Carib's Leap or Leaper's Hill Sotares permeates our consciousness in a recurring nightmare played out for the past three centuries and more. It is a tale we tell each other, our children, our grandchildren, and all who visit the forlorn hill overlooking the small bay where crashing waves whitewash genocide. It is a sadness, the feeling of loss, the sense of injustice, and the anger that daily accords visitors to the site, but also the belief that this surreal memory must be kept alive. This tale of massacre is one told across the region, and despite the belief that Leaper's Hill may only be an allegory and a Nancy story told since our time began, it, like the others, are at least symbolic of the genocide perpetuated against the Kalinago and Kalina on Grenada and across the region by European invasion and colonization. Thus, the retelling of the tale over and over and over, because this tale needs to be revisited, told from new perspectives, enhanced using technologies that shine light on darkened histories, nuanced with the view of the cultural landscape that renders new interpretations of the old narratives in the light of day. What we know of the story of Leaper's Hill and what most of us learned, especially as children growing up in the shadow of this dark but dramatic tale, derived from three sources, but actually one, as the two others were taken from the first, that of Father Jean-Baptiste Duterte, who wrote his monumental history of the French invasion of the region and the reaction of the resident Kalinago. Much of, that, much of what we know of the Kalinago derives in part from this and other accounts by several French missionaries who accompanied French colonization in the 17th century. What we know from these three writers missionaries, the attack took place maybe in June 1651. It was aided by the, the Kalinago Tomas who was identified as a traitor. It happened as a result of the continuing conflict between the Kalinago and the French that resulted in the former being chased across the island to the northern tip where they had no choice but to jump into the sea to their deaths as they were cornered by the armed French and thus would have been killed anyway. This event brought about the end of the Kalinago on Grenada having perished to, the, to a man and thus extinct from Grenada in this most dramatic fashion. There are a few other embellishments, like the fight by two Frenchmen over a beautiful Kalinago maiden, which was settled by one of them shooting the, one, the, the young lady, thus ending the dispute. 
most of us may have heard parts of all of this tale. In 1975, uh, this book was published. It's called L'Histoire de l'Est de Grenade in Amérique. And it chronicles the first 10 years of the settlement of the French in Grenada. It was anonymously written, but we do know from examined by a number of um, researchers that the person who wrote it was most likely Benigi Brasson, who was also um, a missionary on the island at the time. He was not there for the, for the massacre, but he was there after. So he wrote this his history and that's where we get much more detailed information. And what we learned from Benigi Brasson is that the attack took place exactly on the 30th of May, 1650, and not in June, 1651, as related by Duterte and others. It was aided by the Kalinago Tomas. The attack was in retaliation for attacks by the Kalinago against the French settlements. It, would, it was organized from Martinique with Governor Dupaque personally come in to Grenada with men to carry out the attack. They sailed up to Duquesne Bay, which is just south of uh, Sotez, southwest, where they waited until dusk. With Tomas, they scouted to see the mostly Kalinago and Kalina men were drinking and feasting on the hill, oblivious of the impending attack. Under the cover of darkness, the French attacked the festive gathering of men. What we have learned, the exact date of the massacre being 30th of May, 1650 and the events surrounding it. The reason why there is a discrepancy in the date is because they seem to have been either deliberate or an, an, um, an error in, in placing when the French arrived in Grenada and the date most people have is 1650. The event happened after that, so it would have been in 1651, but the French actually showed up in 1649 and it's a long story why that happened and such. But we now know that the, that the exact date of the event was the 30th of May, 1650, hence why we commemorate it today. We know much more of the details of the attack, what time of the day and by whom. We know that it was mostly Kalinago men and Kalina men who were feasting at that site that were killed. Uh, that the Kalinago did not become extinct as a result, but continued to live in Grenada into the 1700s with about 200 of them recorded around 1735. And from this, the, the basis from which to evaluate this event and continue to explore its history. What exactly did the, where exactly did the massacre take place remains um, quite contentious. We know that it is around the site of a battery the French erected soon after the attack, which is shown in this image here. Um, but as you can see from the map, that, that's very general. We also know that it was close to the church erected by the French in early 1700s when they had settled the area after a long fight with the Kalinago residents. That church was erected in the vicinity of the current Anglican church, an Anglican primary, an Anglican primary school. This property was taken by the British from the French in the late 1700s. Others have proposed a third side, that of Hevelin, on the, um, the hill across the bay. So we are left with three sites for the possible massacre. The current site is quite obvious as it is the site of the Catholic church, but it is not the first Catholic church, but the second Catholic church built in the area. As whoever named the site was unaware of the history of the initial church on the ridge further north. So here's a site of the current Lepers Hill behind the, the current uh, Catholic church. Some have argued that the current geography of the site negates again suicide as historically related, relate, related, adding that the Kalinago jumped off the cliff, but onto the supporting ledge and escaped into secret tunnels they had dug into the cliff. There are many issues with that scenario, the least of which is that it may be incorrect, it may be the incorrect site. 
The current geography may not have been as it was back then. I don't think anyone had identified possible tunnels that may have existed. Also, the French identified bodies floating in the sea the next day. So here is the site of the, of the initial Catholic church that's today occupied by the Anglican church and primary school. And those are clearly seen in the image. The site as is definitely presents a more appealing one that fits either descriptions. A surface archeological survey of the current Lepus Hill site by the Catholic church yielded no Amerindian artifacts. According to Holdren, who looked at the site in the early in the late 90s. A brief survey of the site behind the Anglican Church and Primary School in 2017 did not yield any possible Amerindian remains, but definitely showed signs of a long human habitation. The vexing question of a monument. In 1975, Grenada issued a postage stamp identifying the site but little else. But in 2017, 2007, a monument to the Kalinago, to the Kalinago massacre or suicide was erected on the believed site. There are several errors inscribed on the monument, including incorrect dates and the implication that the Kalinago race ended here. Like previous attempts at recognition, it was emblazoned with a Christian cross, a symbol for many that signified a certain reverence, especially as the site was part of a cemetery. Others have readily saw this as an anatoma to the story of the Kalinago struggles against European invasion and dominance, including their attempts to Christianize the indigenous population, which they vigorously resisted to their deaths. Thus the cross was seen as inappropriate, even offensive. Some might even equate this Christian cross on the Kalinago Memorial to put in a swastika at a concentration camp memorializing the exterminated Jews during World War II. Others still might argue that monuments are more for the living. The Kalinago remain an integral part of who we were, who we are, and who we want to become. As their story is the beginning, the roots stand, as their stories, as their story is the beginning, the roots to our branches, the heart from which our story rises, and without which our narrative of who we are becomes incomplete uprooted, disconnected, and disoriented in this tropical dreamscape. Carib's Leap is not an ending. It never was. It is a part of our founding midscape. It is a site of conscious, conscience where ghostly eternal flame illuminates the darkness that looms over the hill in the fading light of day that May evening in 1650, when French settlers violently attacked Kalinago and Kalina men drinking their wine and feasting with the intent to exterminate them from the settlement landscape. Deepest Hill remains an monument to, resistance and a and to their resistance and survival. Leapers Hill remains a monument to their resistance and survival despite the overwhelming odds of European guns, germs, and steel. It commemorates the memories of a people whose faded languages keep us connected like a string of word, words on finger-worn prayer beads. Their name places ground us in our identity. Their cultural knowledge of this landscape informs our heritage. Let's us celebrate Grenadian heritage and keep their contributions to the Camarón landscape alive. And as, Derek Wal as, and as noble laureate Derek Walcott commiserates, I leapt for the pride of that race at Sotez, an urge more than mine. So see them as heroes or as the Gardarine swine. A few notes on heritage in Grenada. Locating the, the narrative of representation of the Calinago and Kalina in the Grenadian landscape must begin with words. 
for it is within lost languages that lie the handful of words that directly connect us today to the people who named this landscape. Only a few indigenous place names are recorded on the early French maps of Grenada, with several other places associated with Kalina, Kalinago and Kalina villages also identified. These few words, these altered words of mislaid vernaculars, and these persistent places faintly remind us of how the Kalinago claimed this land, islandscape, renaming it in their image. The familiar words trip off the tongue as if we were there when they were first spoken, when they first rendered this Camohan landscape, this Grenada landscape. Like an indigenous alphabet we learned as a child, we recite A for Abuti, Ajupa, Anoli, B for Bakai, Bakolet, Butu, C for Kamahon, Kambala, Karaku, Kawad, Kolibri, G for Galibi, Genep, Guava, Grugru, Guav, I for Iguana, K for Kumaka, L for Lambi, Levera, M for Mabuya, Mahod, Manati, Maniku, Marigo, Mar Maruba, Mobi, Meneri, P for Pirog, R for Roku, T for Tanya, T Titiri, Y for Yours, trailing off as if our memory of those languages suddenly vanished and we aimlessly scour the landscape tongue-tied. Our provision gardens, our provision gardens today have their origins in the indigenous Kunukos, with their many indigenous vegetables and fruits, including cassava, sweet potato, maize, kidney beans, tanya, ararut, Indian yam, peppers, pumpkin, guava, mami apple, papaya, sapodilla, star apple, sawasap, sugar apple, hog plum, roku, cotton, coco plum, guinep, custard apple. For many of these and others, the Kalinago derived bush medicine steeped with botanical knowledge that they passed on to enslaved Africans and whose descendants today still use these remedies to cure ailments and alleviate physical and psychological ills. Even techniques of the practice of subsistence agriculture were transferred from indigenous experiences like ring bark and for land clearance, preparing mounds for root vegetables and corn, deciding when and where to sow and, and harvest indigenous crops, and when to cut a tree to make a canoe depending on the phase of the moon. Other practices like fishing, especially inshore and reef fishing, diving and clearing, lambi, conch, sea turtle and sea egg, urchin, torching crabs in the mangroves, catching crayfish in the river, titiria de boucheru, collecting brigo or wilts from the rocks or using the bark of the maruba tree to stun fish for easier harvesting and food preparations, particularly the processing of bitter cassava to make cassava flour for bread and farine, the bitter thirst quenching drink of Mobi, the aphrodisiac bobande and the decades old multi meat dish pepper pot. It is evident that both Europeans and enslaved Africans were obligated to adopt processes and practices of everyday indigenous lifestyle already embedded in the Kalinago fashion landscape in order to survive and eventually rewrite, overwrite, and reimagine this islandscape as a Creole space. Though we, though we usually associate Grenada's folklore and folk traditions with origins in West and West Central Africa and Western Europe, we can no longer ignore the fact that characteristics of indigenous folk beliefs and practices, particularly of the Kalinago, were transferred to the enslaved population and thus became part of the island's Creole cultural landscape. These blended in almost seamlessly that they became indistinguishable, just like botanical knowledge, subsistence agriculture practices and fishing techniques. These include the folk beliefs like Papa Bois, the protector of the forest and animals that bears resemblance to the master of animals among several groups in Northern South America today. Or Mama Glow or Mami Wata, that mimics the water mama of an indigenous water spirits of the mainland that inhabit and rule over water sources like rivers and lakes. Or the ominous spirits of the dead or Mabuya that inhabit the Jumbi tree, silk cotton tree, Jumbi bird, barn owl, Jumbi umbrella, mushroom, and other spirits that possess and rule over the doctrinal landscape. The mystical tale of the Cribo snake and its continuous search for its stolen crown of jewels or diamonds. The, ma the ma magical colibri or doctor bird, hummingbird, that feeds on the nectar of tobacco plants in its dialogue with the gods. 
the Maroon, a cooperative work party that bears similarity to the Kowaj piece that was practiced most recently among the Kalinago canoe builders of Dominica to encourage others to assist with the building and launching of canoes or the respect and fear associated with the sacred silk cotton tree or kumaka tree that should not be felled because it is a spirit tree or the blowing of the lambi or conch shell by fishermen or carnival celebrants as an adopted practice of communication and celebration. All of these and more have origins and are connections to the Kalinago as their mythology and rituals inhabited and roamed freely across Camahon's ritual cultural landscape that Europeans and especially enslaved Africans embraced when they occup occupied it after 1649 and continuing these cultural practices, eventually reimagining it as their own despite overseeing the transformation of that indigenous landscape. Some of the material culture of the Kalinago that have persisted in the Grenadian landscape are not so easily accessible as they have become part of lost memories now embedded in the Creole cultural landscape or buried by centuries of landscape change that require excavations and interpretations by archeologists, linguists, historians, folklorists, geneticists, and anthropologists. There have been several archeological excavations carried out in Grenada, but most have concentrated on the pre-colonial era. Only recently have there been excavations specifically focused on the so-called contact period or the era of European invasion that have shed some light on the Kalinago occupation of Camarón. The most detailed excavation of a Kalinago site took place in 2016 and 2017 in the village of La Potri, St. Andrew, revealing that the area most likely held one of the last free Kalinago. Uh, yeah. Thanks. The, the retrieval of European artifacts established La Potri as a possible contact site as a result of trade between the Spanish or Portuguese and the Calinago. Along with these have been the recovery of Cayo pottery, now associated, now associated with the Calinago, exposing a more detailed picture of the technology and lifeways of Grenada's last indigenous peoples. Today, the recreations of the Calinago and indigenous can be seen every day, though many fail to make the deeper connections. Connecting to Grenada's indig immediate indigenous past can be seen across the island in several public displays that include the use of, of terms Carib, Kalinago, and Camahon as the names of stores and business, a hotel, restaurants, a park, sports teams, and even a rum made by Clark's Ford Distillery. The government of Grenada created the Camahon Award as a national award and a now defunct Camahon Folk Festival that attempted to revive the island's disappearing folk culture. All of these are overshadowed by Carib beer, the most popular beer in the Southern Caribbean and made at the Carib factory in Grand Dance that can be found at every bar and restaurant in Grenada. For most, these are the, continu the continuing resonance of indigenous identity on Grenada. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John Angus Martin, for that very illuminating presentation, uh, reminding us that it is our role as scholars and intellectuals of indigenous heritage to challenge what we think we know about indigenous heritage. I mean, the, the, the fact that the very site of Carib's Leap is contested is something for us to really uh, ruminate upon that we're not even sure that where we call Carib sleep is actually Carib sleep. Um, the fact that our indigenous heritage persists and that we can find it if we look, that we can find it in our material culture, in our foodways, in, uh, in the very landscape itself, in the way that places are named and in the cultural practices that persist in terms of the way that we build our houses, that we fish and, and farm and so on it just brings to mind the fact that there is still so much to uncover about, about our indigenous ancestors. There is still so much to uncover, to research, um, to speak about. Uh, Angus referenced what's happening in Dominica, the, um, 
the maroon and how uh, Dominican indigenous people come together to launch their boats and have their maroons and, and that that is something that we do here when we're building houses. But also it reminds us that in a place like Dominica, indigenous heritage has a certain, occupies a certain position that maybe it doesn't in Grenada just yet. And later on in the this evening's program, we're going to hear from someone who is on the ground in that part of the world and who is very invested in um, researching and highlighting the importance of indigenous heritage. So thank you again, Angus. Uh, I'd like to let those of you on the Zoom uh, meet know that you can post your questions in the chat. So there's a chat function there. We will be keeping our eyes on the chat to um, take your questions, which will come later on at the end of the session. At this time, it's my pleasure to deliver to you a message from uh, the Honorable Ambassador Ali S. Gill, who is the chair of the Grenada National Reparations Committee Commission. And he says, friends and colleagues, on behalf of the Grenada National Reparations Commission, I would like to commend Commissioner Peter Entwine and his team for hosting this very important educational forum in remembrance of indigenous peoples here in Grenada and throughout the Caribbean region. As we educate ourselves on the significant contributions made by indigenous peoples on this island, named by and known to the first inhabitants of this beautiful island as Kamahorn and this region as Caribe, we must also remember clearly their resistance to conquer, conquest and plunder by European invaders and that the legacy of indigenous peoples on this island and in this region is not only a rich cultural legacy that we are still unearthing today, but also the unflinching commitment to self-determination and survival. The event of 38 May 1650 in Mondesate St. Patrick is not a singular event, but one of many acts of resistance by indigenous peoples in our region, an event we must always remember as a nation. The refusal of our indigenous ancestors to surrender and succumb to colonial rule is the ultimate act of defiance and determination by a people who may have understood then the horrors of subjugation and oppression and realized that dying may have been the ultimate act of resistance and sacrifice. As the descendants of people of African descent amplify the call for reparatory justice, we know that no movement for reparations for slavery is complete without an acknowledgement of what was done to indigenous peoples and full and meaningful engagement with descendants of indigenous peoples here in Grenada. Our struggle for reparations is one struggle. And as one people, a people who experience what we know now were crimes against humanity. Therefore, it is with great honor that I stand with Comrade Peter and those working tirelessly to make sure that the cultural artifacts, stories, et cetera, important elements of our rich indigenous history and heritage do not remain lost or buried, but that they are excavated and elevated and that the contributions of our indigenous ancestors, especially their acts of resistance against enslavement and, colo and coloni colonization become an essential part of public discourse here in Grenada and throughout the region. And I truly believe that the first step toward reclaiming and amplifying that history and heritage is by officially recognizing and remembering 30th May as Mont de Sautez, Lipa's Hill, as Remembrance Day and Indigenous Peoples Day. The Grenada National Reparations Commission looks forward to working hand in hand with those involved in this campaign to make this important Remembrance Day a reality here in Camahon. In solidarity, Ali Selimbi Gill, Chairman of the Grenada National Reparations Commission. Our second speaker is Dr. Jonathan Hanna, and he is currently the curator of the Grenada National Museum here in St. George's, Grenada. He is a former U.S. Peace Corps volunteer in Grenada and a graduate from Pennsylvania State University, where he completed his master's degree and doctoral dissertation on the pre-Columbian settlement chronology of Grenada. Dr. Hanna has been living and working in Grenada for the past 10 years and is a founding member and director 
of the Grenada Public Archaeology Network, GPAN, which he aims to build a national network of citizen and community scientists to recognize, document, and protect local heritage sites throughout the Tri Island. Dr. Hanna will be presenting on the topic Archaeological Heritage at CTSB, the prospects of community centered engagement and management. Dr. Hanna? Hi, thank you, Lorna Dell. Um, just going to share my screen here. Okay. Um, right, okay. Um, so uh, this talk will be about the um, archaeological heritage of South Harris Bay and um, Grenada more widely. Um, uh, I'm going to start. Uh, but first, I'm going to go back in time uh, to the very beginning. So <laughs> just as a refresher, um, the first humans to enter the Caribbean uh, came around five to six thousand years ago. Um, there's two general routes that are uh, believed to have occurred, uh, some groups possibly from Central America and another one from uh, South America. The Central American one is really contested. There's, a, um, there's uh, different evidence for and against it. Um, but uh, the, the South American one is, is the one that most um, has the most evidence for. And then every other group that came in um, to the Caribbean after, afterwards uh, was coming out of South America, somewhere on the South American coastline. Now, now the first groups to come in were like hunter-gatherers, uh, or generally say they're hunter-gatherers, but um, we know they did have some uh, some limited agriculture, um, uh, and it's debated about how, how much or how complex that, that they are, uh, but they were fairly mobile on the landscape. Um, and the Windward Islands in particular, there's there's not a lot of evidence for their presence. So it's very like um, ephemeral evidence of them in uh, in Grenada. So um, I know this is kind of busy. Let me see if I can get this uh, spotlight thing. So this is a, uh, a pollen core, uh, several pollen cores and temperature um, uh, graphs that have been done in the region. And um, uh, this just shows sort of the, this is a sort of um, uh, secondary evidence that we have for archaic people. So like these are pollen from Levera uh, cores in Lake Antoine and also Meadow Beach, which is um, next to Pearls. And uh, they all generally show um, a decline of arboreal pollen around 5,000 years ago uh, and a, an increase in charcoal. Though this is some of the best evidence actually that we have of, of, of humans. It's debatable whether it actually is humans because of course, just because all the trees decline uh, it doesn't mean that it was that it was definitely humans, um, but uh, it, it it's generally accepted that um, they were around. It's just uh, their presence was wasn't um, wasn't as permanent as some of the as the other ones. So by about 500 BC, you get this the arrival of um, of ceramic making peoples uh, whose whose artifacts uh, cultural material um, uh, was. I guess didn't degrade as as quickly, and so we we see them show up right away. And it's beautiful pottery, so you know that it wasn't necessarily made right here. It, it's actually being brought in. Um, in Grenada, though, uh, the um, uh, the earliest peoples uh, uh, evidence of these peoples is around 100 AD. So let me see if I have. So this is the uh, radiocarbon sequence we have for Grenada. There's still some dates that aren't in here, but. Generally, um, about one to 200 AD is when you start seeing a lot of um, presence. And then by about seven to 900 AD, you have uh, a very high population. That's like the peak population of Amerindians Indians in Grenada. And it's multiple groups coming in. It's not just one. There's a lot of back and forth between South America. There's intermarrying. There's changes happening in South America, and that gets reflected in the Caribbean. So there's a there's the synergy that's going on. Um, but what is uh, what is uh, well, what is especially um, important to note, and I'll bring up again, is that there's not a lot from the late period, from basically the contact period. So, like we know, 
know from the European accounts that there's Amerindians here, but anytime we go to excavate those sites, most of the time they're, they're, those sites look or appear to be much earlier. One of the reasons uh, we think is that uh, that's some of the last stuff that was on the surface. And so, um, you know, it get, just gets obliterated once Europeans show up. So it wasn't until about the last 10 years that there's been really substantial evidence uh, for um, even like the pottery that Amerindians were making at the time of the island caribs. And uh, that work, especially is uh, uh, Corinne Hoffman and Ari Boomer in, at Leiden have, um, have brought about this evidence, but it's only, but it's very recent and it still shows just how little there is from that time period. So that's gonna come up again because the Sauter's base site obviously dates from that time period, right? Now, um, just, to, just to go back uh, uh, real quick. So there's 88 Amerindian sites in our inventory uh, that we have. So, and spanning that whole period from about one to 200 AD and that's like pearls, a site at Bujuju, maybe one or two others. And then it increases about seven to 900 AD and then slowly kind of decreases. And then um, by the time of Europeans, um, well, I'm not sure exactly actually of how many sites. I think there's like 40 something sites that appear to date to that time period, but we don't have great, uh, really great evidence, um, like definitive evidence. Um, okay, so around, of course, Europeans show up, right? 1492, Columbus sites, Grenada in 1498. It's possible that, um, uh, what's his name? Pinzone Pin um, landed in 1500, possibly with Juan de Acasa. Uh, but the, and there's little snippets that we get uh, from, from the ethno-historic literature about the island. Um, one of the best ones that I wanted to bring up is uh, Nicholas um, de Cardona's account. Uh, he had, he stopped on the Northern um, coast of Grenada in 1614. And uh, he, he, he's attacked by caribs. He was trying to water his boats. And so he has this, there's a, there's a little paragraph in his book about what the, um, you know, the, uh, the account was. And, but it's, it's, you have to take it kind of with a grain of salt because he says they're all cannibals and they're super violent and beasts and savages, right? But he draws this amazing watercolor. And um, uh, immediately, like when I look at it, I mean, this is north, Grenada, uh, uh, there's a compass there. Um, it look, I immediately think of Leapers Hill, right? Uh, uh, however, the, the river is bigger than the current Little St. Patrick River, which would be uh, west of, of Leapers Hill. So it's possible that it might be Helvelin, Irwin's Bay. Um, so it, it doesn't really, either way, it's not really, um, there are sites, there are Mary Indian archeological sites throughout this whole uh, area from Lever all the way down really to, 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 to uh, Big David Bay or Davi. And certainly this whole area um, is, is almost like one big archeological site. And it appears some of the earliest stuff is actually under the town of Sauteres or, or obliterated by the town. Um, but what I, but uh, around 1978, uh, uh, a French archeologist, Henri Penijan Roger, um, noted some sherds he found just west of the Little St. Patrick River, which is uh, just west of the fish market in Sauteres. And since then there have been several um, archeological surveys, uh, most notably 1994 and Cody, uh, excavated about 18 human burials in this area. And that's, um, I get the little annotation thing. And that's these excavations here. Um, and and th this is actually all, the, all her excavations um, on this map. Uh, and, and that was brought about from a sea surge from uh, Hurricane Hugo passing in like 1988 or 1989. Um, so it's, so these kinds of things what happened? The area is prone to erosion. It's um, you know north of the Grenada. You have the two currents in the Caribbean and Atlantic. It's pretty rough seas. Uh, the thing is about this is that it's the really just one event, right? It doesn't go on for weeks and months and months and months. It's like one, it's just one thing. Beginning in well, ah, couldn't get rid of the beginning. Um, uh, in the 2010s, um, there, uh, 
people started to notice that the seas were more rough around Sauterres. There were some studies done. Um, uh, there was notably a study by the USAID in 20, that uh, had a big report in 2013 all about how to, to manage the, 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 um, the, the tides and the swells in, in the bay. Um, and they recommended uh, several breakwaters um, and different structures, uh, as well as like planting lots of trees and things on the coastline and uh, different management strategies. The only thing that really seems to have come out of the project though, was um, the planting of uh, some 400 trees or something uh, that Specto um, did. But almost all the rest of the report appears to have been ignored. But then around 2015 or so, uh, there were some events that seemed to be affecting the actual town itself, which was, uh, and you can see here in the 2015 satellite image, um, this is the lower Sauterres town. You know, um, some of the buildings were getting hit by waves and things, and this caused alarm by some of the business owners and immediately uh, uh, government sprang into action and, and built a breakwater. And actually, I don't have a good picture of the, the breakwater. There is so there's a, a breakwater now coming out of um, the out of the, uh, the, the the bottom of Leapers Hill. That's actually this little spot right here. Um, now, what they didn't realize and that the USAID study, which had done things like sediment transport, that modeling and they, they knew how the swells were occurring um, that put it, that wasn't where you should put a breakwater. And so that, that actually exacerbated the problem. It actually, it, well, it saved the town, but it just pushed the swell elsewhere. So actually in this 2020 satellite, you can see the town's looking great. And anyone who's been there recently would know uh, the beach there is great. Um, it's, it's bigger than it was and um, it, it's, it's pretty nice. Uh, they had, it appears they had some other plans uh, that were part of the breakwater and for whatever reason it wasn't continued. So um, for a while now I've been saying that they should just finish what they were doing if they had more to do. But certainly there, there should be some, some other structure put in place to try to mitigate this. Um, but the, uh, unbeknownst to a lot of people, uh, it's not just the breakwater, that, that just happened to be one um, part of this sort of catastrophe. The other part is that there had been sand mining for years, really, but that had increased um, 2016, 2017, where you actually had backhoes and dump trucks on the Mount Craven and Rodney Bay Beach, which is right here, uh, that were just taking sand from the area, um, making it completely vulnerable. So once you get the breakwater um, built and that redirects the swell in this area, obviously you get this you can just see this bulge here. Uh, and that's what's happening um, at Mount Craven and Mount Rodney. And on the ground, oh, so these are all the, these are all the finds that have been found since basically 1994. These are Ancody's excavations and all these are um, uh, GPS point with, with Leiden and also on other surveys I made. Um, all of the, the, the um, crosses are our burials. Uh, not all of them have been collected, so, um, but we have about 40 human burials uh, that were that were collected, and you know many more have been just lost and falling into the sea even today. Uh, this, these are some pictures of what the drastic difference, especially between 2017 and 2018, when it, when the breakwater was finished. So that really exacerbated a lot of the, the problems that just eat away the whole beach. Um, and then this is even this past January. So what's interesting is that the, um, the current erosion, it really happens in the dry season. And, uh, but by about this time, I haven't been up there, but I would expect about this time, um, or certainly by the start of the rainy season, the beach basically comes back to some degree, but, um, and then, and then the dry season comes and it takes more and it, it takes more. But unfortunately this is, uh, culturally sterile sands, right? So the, the archaeological site is not is gone and then they just put the sterile sand there. So that's still not really solving any of the, of the problem. Um, and, you know, we're only a few months away from the next rounds. And every year there are burials and, and skulls showing up on, on the beach. 
Um, and uh, so the, the studies that we've done on, on these burials are, they're all Amerindian. Uh, I know Leiden is, is doing, um, they have a DNA study they're gonna be doing on the ones they've collected. Um, there's about another 20 or so we have at the museum, maybe 30 uh, from Ann Cody stuff. And then more recently that we're also gonna be doing some DNA through another study. Um, but all the artifactual evidence points to it being a Mary Indian. All the radiocarbon dates show that they're uh, mostly between 11 to 1200 AD, but there is potential for a little earlier um, based on Cody's work. She, um, she had found some earlier parts of the site. And then um, the, some of the pottery indicates that some of them might be later. And that's really a, the critical thing. As I was saying, a lot of these sites are, uh, um, a lot of these contact period sites, uh, just, we just don't have them anymore. So, to, so if you have human burials from this time period, potentially people related to people, I mean, a generation or two away from the Leap or Sill incident, that's a pretty huge, huge deal. Um, just to show another image of what some of the erosion, this is a, one of the excavations we did on a burial. Um, and this is what it looks like where the burial was uh, uh, on a 1951, um, aerial survey by the British Department of Overseas Services. So it's about 30 meters of, of uh, shoreline that's been lost since, since 2015. And so again, so this, uh, here is the Sauter's Bay. This is the Sauter's Bay dates here. So you see how they kind of go right up to, into 60 to 1600s. And I'm pretty sure that once we do more radiocarbon dates, we're gonna get later, some later dates. Um, but regardless of the you know, specific uh, circumstances of Sauter's Bay at the moment, every site in Grenada is basically under threat in some way uh, by development or just by climate change, coastal development, um, almost every site. Uh, so in a way, Sauter's Bay is like a bellwether for what's to come in the next 50 to 100 years as sea levels rise and as, um, you know, uh, uh, storms and um, uh, uh, warmer seas create, you know, just exacerbate the sort of climate changes happening. Um, so the, so the archeological sites are, are severely under threat. And these are, of course, things that, um, you know, those burials of the pictures I just showed, they hadn't seen the light of day for a thousand years. Um, and these are like time capsules that you know, once they're gone, you can never get it back, right? <laughs> so why not at least look at the time capsule before you let it disappear? Um, so, so to get to my community engagement aspect of this, you know, archaeologists can't do this on our own. And there needs to be, you know, sort of a grassroots effort and interest, you know, for it to happen, for us to do more work. Um, so, uh, you know, for the last few years, I've been involved in uh, several efforts with Ministry of Tourism and, um, and also a group that um, Angus and Lorna Dale and I uh, formed, HRGC. Um, so to, to try to improve public education uh, about marine heritage or all heritage aspects. But as Angus just showed, um, we're all a little Mary Indian in Grenada. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Uh, and also the Mount Rich Petroglyph uh, Interpretation Center, uh, which um, was run by a youth group in Mount Rich, and then um, Petroglyph Path, which was done with Ministry of Tourism. So to try to highlight some of these sites and the importance of them. And there's so many more sites that we should be highlighting and, and looking at. Uh, and so the, the, the crux of it is that you really need, um, you know, uh, groups of citizen scientists around the country that are you know, collecting, recording, monitoring sites in their communities. And so that's what's behind um, this new effort of the Grenada Public Archaeology Network, uh, which um, Peter Antoine and I and Lorna Dell, uh, we just uh, got, got our proposal funded through UNESCO. And the first, uh, well, and the, the, the first application of it will be in, um, in Sauterres and Saint, it, it'll be St. Patrick's broadly, but loosely based on the Sauterres Bay sites and around the area. We also did one in Las Ages back in December that was funded by a range development. Um, uh, 
Uh, and so that so that was sort of a prototype for how we're going to do this all over. We would like to do it in every parish. Basically, you know, there's there's people that are interested in heritage everywhere and are eager to to learn the techniques and methods. Um, and so just training people in um, basic recording using a GPS, how to recognize a Mary Indian versus historic pottery, even historic architecture recording, things like that. Um, just having this group of citizen scientists that um, whenever a site appears, they, they're there to, to swoop in and, and start the documentation process. And ideally it would be based in the museum, which is where I am, uh, as the museum is basically the sort of legal authority for archeology span in the country now. Um, but at the moment, it's really just kind of a loose, um, a loose group that we would just like to keep them tied together and to do even monthly uh, uh, get togethers and some sort of activity um, where you kind of build your skills towards um, towards different different things. It might even involve things like, um, well, aside from what I already mentioned, like cemetery mapping or even shipwrecks, things like that. Uh, so just documenting all of um, the heritage in Grenada, and then the you know the important part of this is you can't preserve everything, but once you have an inventory of what's there, you can decide what's important and what maybe they could build a hotel on top of or, or whatever, but you have to know what's there before you can make those kinds of decisions, right? Um, so I have lots of recommendations. I won't go, go through them all, but certainly finishing the sort of structural measures in the Salteris Bay area, um, which were recommended in the USAID reports. Um, more data collection, coastal monitoring. Uh, I know there's some environmental groups that are actively doing this and that data is crucial and so important to how, how we, we mitigate these problems. Um, a lot of these sites need to be listed. There's only really two sites technically listed in Grenada. It's like Pearls and Grand Bay, Cariacou. Um, the uh, Museum Act of 2017, I guess technically protects all of them, but actually having them listed by name and then um, having them survey the actual areas of where they are would would um, ensure their protection. Um, and ensuring that there's archaeological impact assessments before a lot of these construction projects, because a lot of it can just be, you know, as I said, we had known there was an archaeological site there since 1978. Um, so it was no surprise that <laughs> this is happening. Um, if only we had been um, alerted to it earlier, we could have, you know, maybe done something more or alerted authorities to it. Um, and also things like protocols for, for burials so that when, um, and this relates to the GPAN, um, uh, pr program as well, is that when uh, like a burial is found in particular, um, this just happened in True Blue recently, um, you know, the police are usually called, that's exactly what should happen. But then, um, you know, the police, if they determine that it's old and it's not, uh, it's not a recent murder or something, um, then, uh, you know, they would call the museum and the museum would then call their, the, the nearest GPAN group who could go out and start documenting things. Um, and so then you get this whole, this whole integration. Uh, and so that's where the community stewardship comes in. And then also a repository, um, especially, uh, you know, maybe smaller interpretation centers around the country. So it's not all centered at the National Museum in St. George's, but that there are areas um, where we have lots of archeological material and they could just stay up there. Uh, and that, so the Salters Bay site is, is exactly, um, an example of that. And also, you know, once we do all this DNA and the radiocarbon dating and stable isotopes and everything on the burials, there's really no need to keep them in a box in storage. And it's kind of unethical to do that. So doing some sort of reburial ceremony for these burials um, and having a place sort of of remembrance, um, maybe in Salteris, maybe not at Leap or so, I don't know what would be the best place. The community would have to decide that, but then you have a sort of memorial and a place um, that you can go on May 30th even and 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 uh, and, and talk about these things and sort of commemorate the legacy. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you, John, for... Uh very informative um, presentation. 
Um, I guess I'm going to speak as a Grenadian in this context. For me, because history in the Caribbean is historically focused on the remembrance of dates and specifically related, related to colonial history. For example, I remember as a child having to recall the dates Christopher Columbus discovered or sighted Grenada, as well as remembering the names of the three ships which he and his men would have um, traveled to the New World. As students, we were also taught that the peoples who were encountered, they were barbaric and, and, and they ate other humans. It was um, the view of Columbus that the man-eaten Caribs contravened by acts of sodomy and cannibalism, and therefore should be enslaved and punished. Stories of this nature continued throughout my education and in many ways shaped the way I perceived the past. This perception remained with me for many years until uh, in my latter years of uh, my undergraduate studies where I met Dr. Nico Philip Dow, that I took her history class. And while we were focused on the prehistory and the African history, I was somehow drawn to, I guess, our indigenous past, right? Um, particularly as our, our Grenadian um, teaching of, of, of history generally begins with a European perspective, right? So it is important for us to note from the presentation that Dr. Hannah just gave that life on this landscape began long before European contact. The radiocarbon dates demonstrate that. There are continuous or there were continuous occupations long before the Galibes and the Carib invasion. There are groups of indigenous peoples, there are more than one, who came from the mainland, who integrated, assimilated, and possibly I'm of the opinion they acculturated. The materiality of the pots shows that demonstrates that. The material culture and the techniques that was used on the, on the islands and the various islands, Dominica, St. Vincent, they are parallel or similar to what occurred on the mainland and the coastland. And again, um, if we look at the, I guess, the Guyanas region, that can also um, demonstrate their life. Um, long before European contact. So with the archaeological work that's about to start at TSB, it is important for us as archaeologists, historians, geologists, conservationists to understand the different um, periods in our history. Um, for archaeologists, it's the material culture, the ceramic periods. And studying the past is an important aspect for any and all of human civilizations. There must be a beginning for us to know where we're going or the end, right? So what I mean by this is that we can't want to acknowledge one aspect of our history and neglect other aspects of it, right? This side of our history might be an unpleasant one, but it's something that we should remember. Our past is our connection to the future. And by preserving and protecting and properly documenting the past, it is key for all of us to start to make sense of our own world. It is their history, his story, and then it is our history. The science of archaeology as we know it, yes, is a mythological one. And by slowly unearthing the past, we can reconstruct it, right? Um, John mentioned the different um, challenges as archaeologists has, that we face. There is the environment temperatures, there are the man-made um, problems, right? And so archaeology, as we know it, is very destructive. However, if it is done in a correct way, we can carefully document our past. We can recognize it. And as, and as was mentioned, no one event can tell us about our past. It's compressed in time in the smallest sample of the soil. So time, space, and casualty can help us as archaeologists help us better understand the past. And once we have moved an object, right, because there's a lot, lot of looting that occurs within the various archaeological spaces. I'm not sure, I'm sure this is not unique to Grenada, right? But once you move an object, you are taking it out of its context, making it harder for us to understand our past. So as John mentioned, there's a protocol. If you see something, you probably, call the police, and then the police will, would contact the relevant persons, which is us, right? So there's a lot for us uh, for us to learn, and we can't learn from it if we keep moving the objects. We need context. 
Hence, um, we require the proper uh, and proper documentation, the, leg the legislation processes, we, we need to adhere to them and, and make sure that they enforce. We need to make sure that it's protected. We need to make sure that um, it's conserved. And as John said, we can't protect everything, but it can help us to understand if it's done in a proper way. It can help us to understand and give us the tools to redress and negate our indigenous past. Every archaeological site for us in the Caribbean, not just in Grenada, is unique. Every archaeological site has a contribution. Every archaeological site has an impact or can impact for us to understand the life ways, the pathways, our culture, put it simple. So insight into, the, into our archaeological data or our archaeological materiality, it can help us change the narratives that was propagated and created by European contact about the new world. And with the preservation of the material culture, this will help us provide the cultural resources, which can be the source of our heritage education and um, afford governments and other stakeholders with information for the development of um, heritage research in general, not just in Grenada or in the Caribbean, but in, in, in the wiser spheres of, 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 of the world. Um, so Jonathan, thank you so much for a very informative um, presentation. And we know that we have a lot of work to do. We are, we are extending our hands for when we start our excavation um, next month at the CTSP that um, persons within the various communities will already come and, 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 and help us, yeah? So we now have a special message from one of our members of the Kalinago um, community in Dominica, that is Ovich Naniche Abust. And he's um, a descendant and has served as chief for his people and other in other capacities. In the Kalinaga language, his name is Naniche, which means courageous one. He's currently the president of the Caribbean Amerindian Development Organization and the field office of the National Employment Program of the Indigenous Communities in Dominica. Uh, Nietzsche is also the owner and manager of Nietzsche's Indigenous Adventures, a business which provides tourism-based experiences to visitors from around the world. He was a co-founder of the Dominican-based Carifuna Cultural Group, 17, 1979, sorry, and a founding member of the Caribbean Organization of Indigenous Peoples in 1988. Naniche is very proud of his connections to Grenada and calls it home too. Where in 1990, 1981, he graduated with a general agriculture certification after he had served for four years as an agricultural extension officer when he returned to his homeland in Dominica in the early 1980s. In 1994, he was elected as the youngest chief in the history of the Kalinago people, and he served it within that position for the next 10 years until 1994. So a message from our fellow Dominican former Carif chief. Greetings to all, and congratulations to the persons who have worked hard for putting this event together, and thanks for inviting me. I am humbled and honored to be part of this wonderful initiative as it forms part of another new page in the history of the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean and certainly what I refer to as the wider indigenous world. By way of additional introduction, my passion has been and will always be about our existence as indigenous peoples. Unfortunately, our existence and development have been retarded by the neglect of national institutions for a very, very long time. In the situation of Dominica, it's only in recent years that we have been recognized as different and special. A number of projects are ongoing and our name change from <laughs> was made official. It's my understanding that very soon the parliament will make the name Kalinago territory official also. Indigenous regional networking is the key for us who have interest in the development of the first peoples. For example, back in the 80s when I served as chief of my nation, 
I was faced with a lot of hostility from the then government. But the regional alliances with Belize, Guyana, St. Vincent and the Grenadines was effective, by which I was able to do a lot of advocacy for our cause, and it attracted international organizations to work with us. Those were not the days of too many computers far more for the internet, and so regional radio was our greatest medium for being heard. I mention this to make the point that I am happy and will give support to any organization or persons who are interested in indigenous people's recognition and development. In the most recent work of the archaeologist led by Professor Corinne Hoffman of the Leiden University, it is worth recognition in many ways, but it's too much to mention as I see it through the eye of an indigenous person. But I will say though, it is a solid foundation for the work that is now being done at these forums. Our civilization was destroyed centuries ago without the thought of any serious discussion of compensation. We deserve indigenous days and opportunities to continue to prove our capabilities in any field of occupation. Gone are the days of savage cannibal stories and peaceful Arawaks as forms of division among our relatives. Thanks for the opportunity to present. And thank you Grenada for making me feel welcome when I attended the then Maribo Agricultural Training School and when I visited as chief in 1992. Thanks again to all and long live the first indigenous peoples of the Caribbean. Thank you. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our third presenter for this afternoon, Dr. Lennox Honeychurch. Dr. Honeychurch is a, I'm sorry, Dr. Honeychurch will be presenting on the theme the Dominica Kalinago Territory, an example of maintaining the indigenous people's presence on islands lost to them. So Dr. Honeychurch will be addressing a lot of points that have been made earlier, speaking about continuities in, in indigenous uh, culture that exists and that we can find if we just look for them. Dr. Honeychurch is a Dominican anthropologist, historian, academic and artist, whose research work is mainly concerned with the contact and cultural exchange between the Kalinago people of the Lesser Antilles and arrivals from Europe and Africa. He studied anthropology at the University of Oxford and works from his base in Dominica. He is a member of the Dominica Reparations Committee. Dr. Honeychurch. Thank you very much indeed for that introduction. Very interesting, all my colleagues who have already presented. Um, I am going to be talking about the areas across the Caribbean, focusing, of course, eventually on Dominica, where Kalinago people have been able to retreat and reform and face the 21st century and deal with the issues which are being covered here at this um, presentation. I'm going to be giving a PowerPoint presentation on um, that aspect. We've got the theme, maintaining uh, indigenous people's presence on the islands lost to them. An example of the Kalinago territory, Dominica, whose indigenous name is Waitukubuli, a name which is, uh, we were thinking of renaming Dominica, on independence in 1978, but the majority view was it was too complicated. And yet, ironically, so many things are now being called Waitukubuli, business groups, sports teams, uh, products. Uh, so it does, it shows that, you, you know, it could have been done, but it survives in so many ways with us. Let us go back to um, the 1650s. And to get an idea of the state of play among the Kalinago Islands at that time, 
what is interesting is the fact that although in our historical record and in fact in our awareness of our region, the sub-region of the Eastern Caribbean, our history, our general history tends to hop from the initial colonization by Europeans, be they the English in St. Kitts, Liamuiga, or in Barbados, for instance, in 1627, or the French in uh, the islands of Martinique and Guadeloupe, and then hops almost straight in to the period of sugar uh, domination and the sugar revolution within, not realizing that there has been from the pre-Columbian period, from the passage of Columbus in 1493 through the islands, and then onwards uh, into the early European settlements and conflict, that there was a very active um, period uh, spanning some 150 years of the Kalinago people within our islands in a period of contact and culture exchange. And this can actually be represented in the work of Father Raymond Breton, a missionary from France who uh, settled in the Dominican, uh, with the Dominican order in a mission in Guadeloupe and lived for many years in Dominica and traveled up and down the region. And even in that time, he was able to collect not only the names of the islands from the Kalinago people who remained on the islands, but also a wide range of um, names related mainly to place names, plants, and animals. And those areas that still maintain a large group of descendants of the Kalinago people, such as Dominica, uh, maintain these words in their language or has been pointed out by our first presenter um, in Grenada, for instance, and elsewhere, names that we don't even realize are Kalinago names, but have been handed down to us for things like animals, fruit, reptiles, and places. We see some of them, for instance, survive in Cariacou, Bekwe, Kanwan, um, and some of the other islands uh, of the Caribbean. We have places like Liamuiga, the mountain now, Mount Misery in St. Kitts, which uh, adopted that name on, on independence. And uh, names that are very popularly used in Antigua, for instance, Wadadli, whereas Breton actually um, spelt it Waladli. Uh, but these names are used, the airport, for instance, in, um, in St. Lucia, Hiwanora. Their survival is scattered in various ways throughout the islands and used by us every day. And all of this was happening in the 1640s and early 50s, 1650s, because that was when Breton, Father Breton, was active in our islands. So we know from the historical record, if we search it deep enough for it, it can complement the archeological record and that we can realize that there was this active uh, interaction within our region. We also have to deal with the uh, European perspective because we, we have to read this through the European um, accounts. It's like Eric Wolf says, a people, uh, the, the history of a people without history, you've almost got to read between the lines in assessing the documentation. And even so in the illustrations. So here we have a, a, an engraving from Leclerc over there on the left from the uh, 17th century. And a number of aspects, the ajupa, the hammock, the three rocks um, with the canary pot boiling on it. Uh, that is from the 17th century. And yet way into the second half of the uh, 18th century in the 1760s and 1770s in places like St. Vincent and Dominica, we have the Italian artist, Agostino Brunias, painting these idyllic scenes, many of which may have passed on. I mean, he was kind of recreating an idyllic past. We must remember at that time that Jean-Jacques Rousseau had coined the phrase, uh, the noble savage. He had used the work of de Tetre and his accounts of the Kalinago people in his book on the social contract as the idealistic um, 
way of human interaction and, and living. So there's a lot going on at that time that is represented both in the documentation and uh, in the art of the time. But once again, we've got to analyze it while we link it to the archeological evidence and the historical representation that we have. Now, this period, if we're keying it around 1650, um, is a period which from the 15th, early um, 16th century uh, is a, a very brutal period of interaction uh, besides the fact that you've got your cultural exchange and your trading going on. Uh, we have accounts, for instance, in Dominica in 1514, when Pedro Arias de Avia is on his way to what is today Panama, and uh, the accounts of trading that are going on on the southwest coast of uh, Dominica. And we see the, um, the things which are being traded. We read accounts from Francis Drake and others of the uh, tools that the Europeans are handing over greatly prized by the indigenous people when you think that it would take about two or three weeks to grind a stone ax on one of the um, igneous rocks on the shores of the island to create an ax which would probably break. And of the attraction of trading goods and even land for a uh, iron ax and other tools, cutlasses and scissors and things which are represented in the text. Uh, we have a threat to the land along the Eastern Caribbean, of which, for instance, the whole story of Sotez is part that was going on at this time when the indigenous people attempted to stem the tide of, of the land being overtaken by the um, Europeans, mainly in this part of the world by the English and the French. We have earlier, period, which a few documents have been written about it, but it is not an area that has been dealt with sufficiently. And this is the Spanish slave raiders sweeping into the Eastern Caribbean. They are given authority by the Spanish crown under the cedulas, one of 1503, the most impactful in 1511, to come down to these islands south of Puerto Rico and wipe out, take and sell duty free in the Greater Antilles, the any Kalinago person, because they eat human flesh, according to those accounts, and that they are against Christians. And so we get this, um, this feeling against the representation, the image, the icon of Christianity, the cross, which features for at least over 150 years in the islands, right up into the 18th century in Dominica, we have the Kalinago people tearing down crosses because it, it represents oppression and the forces of Christianity through these missionaries attempting to, um, to, to convert the Caribs and to learn about their past. Uh, in these islands, we have the trading going on, as I mentioned, in 1514. Reprisals against the English begin in St. Lucia in 1605, when um, the, a, a group of English persons established themselves temporarily on the south coast at what is today view fort in St. Lucia. And we have a, a pictorial representation of this conflict. And you can see here, I use it very, very much to show this conflict between the steel and the gunpowder of the English, the Europeans generally, and the clubs and the bows and arrows of the indigenous Kalinago people. This is all going on. It's part of that wider picture, which is going to intensify up into the 1650s and beyond. And then a massacre of Jesuit missionaries in St. Vincent on the 23rd of January, 1654. Once again, this conflict between the, the religious beliefs of the European uh, imposing itself upon the traditional understanding of the Amerindian world and uh, makes itself manifest, not only in St. Vincent, it's one of the better cases that we know, but elsewhere. And it has earlier on been carried out up in the Greater Antilles. 
and in the Greater Antilles, the tragic um, decimation of the Taino population up there, which includes, according to their accounts, um, suicidal uh, moves, jumping off cliffs, and uh, uh, eating poison, and aborting children, all of this taking place in an earlier period in the Greater Antilles, which is feeding into uh, what is going to be happening in the Lesser Antilles. And so the Europeans, having to deal with this on these islands, begin to attempt some aspect of pacification by giving uh, some sort of um, assurance of lands that will be reserved at which they will be allowed to stay, that is the Kalinago people, if they cease their incursions onto the settlement. So they're trying to create <laughs> what actually they're trying to create today in Israel, uh, two totally different cultural backgrounds and particularly religious groups and claimants to land uh, to try to divide these lands between them and to settle the issues by providing the indigenous people with some sort of assurance of land. Uh, we get this in the early days in the 1650s in Martinique, where the, from his early settlement, the governor du Parquet uh, makes a deal that the rugged windward coast, and this happens throughout the islands, it's always the windward coast, the rugged Atlantic coast that is being given as a sort of peace offering to those indigenous people. And so on the map of um, Martinique, the early maps of Martinique, we have um, the area uh, which is for Les Sauvages, as they called the Kalinago people. So um, the agreement was in 1657, it in intensifies because what's happening is that more and more uh, enslaved Africans are coming into the islands, and in this case into Martinique, and uh, Dutet tries to make an agreement whereby uh, the Kalinago people will um, ensure that they will not harbor escaped slaves. In fact, they will hand them over to the French, and that's one of the attractions, that's one of the terms of the agreement. This falls apart uh, by the 1650s, and most of the Kalinago people retreat to Dominica. Dominica and St. Vincent become the place of retreat uh, when these agreements are happening. What is also happening at this time, which makes it more intense, is that from the 1640s, you have the introduction of sugar, sugar cane and sugar production. And the land demanded and required for sugar production increases and intensifies, and therefore the pressure on the Kalinago people also intensifies as they want to take the land away. And if you understand Kalinago culture, Amerindian culture of any kind, you realize that what is happening is that whole areas of land, of landscape, of, of natural resources are being destroyed. You can't just give a person a few acres of land and say, live on it. Because in the Amerindian world, the resources are seasonal, they spread over large areas, they are um, both on land and sea, they require freedom of movement. All of these things are um, constrained when you are going to try to limit them by boundaries. Boundaries just don't make sense to the Amerindian mind. Later on, even as late as the 19th century in the 1880s, the French attempt in Guadeloupe to uh, give an area of land once again out on the windward coast, uh, rather barren land in the Northeast, um, very um, weak productive areas, hardly uh, any production. And once again, the last of those Kalinago people bit by bit either mix with the French population or the African free people, or they move across to Dominica. So here are these attempts at setting up these reserves uh, in these islands at the time. And then the British take over uh, in 1763, uh, the islands formerly that had been 
designated as Kalinago zones. Now we have some early treaties coming out. We have a treaty of uh, St. Christopher, uh, that is of course in St. Kitts, uh, the Treaty of Bastia on the 31st of March, 1660, when it is agreed under in the last days of the life of the French governor there, uh, de Poncy, signs an agreement to say that Dominica and St. Vincent will be left forever to the indigenous people. This is, of course, at a time when sugar production is intensifying. The attacks um, are still active, the Kalinago attacks on settlements, and they want to get the peace with the Kalinago people as much as possible and just give them areas where they would retreat to and live. And they give them entire islands this time, Dominica and um, St. Vincent, Waitukubuli and Urome. And that um, treaty of 1660 is reinforced of Nevis between once again, French and British authorities uh, on the 3rd of January, 1668. And it remains de facto in place, but what's happening at the same time is the French uh, former indentured labor who are being themselves pushed out by African arrivals for the sugar industry they're being pushed out of the lands in Martinique and Guadeloupe, and they are seeking little areas where they can establish their small farms and um, uh, operate their, their small businesses. And so what we find is the Petit Blanc, the Engagé, they are moving into those lands like St. Vincent, like Dominica, um, to, to try to get at least a foothold in those places. And there is a mix that is happening. And that is why we find that the indigenous people of Dominica, most of them, if not all, have French surnames because those are French engagés, Petit Blanc, are moving in. Similar situation um, is happening in Grenada. But of course, Grenada was not designated like St. Vincent and Dominica as a retreat, as an island granted forever. And in spite of all of this that's going on, in spite of the French unofficial French occupation of those islands, it's repeated again by the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle as late as 1748. And this designates Dominica and St. Vincent as well, continually to be um, uh, in the hands of the Kalinago. But essentially what's happening is that the British and the French, as the sugar industry increases, are uh, searching more and more for land and bit by bit, they overturn this. And by the Treaty of Paris in 1763, they have taken over both these islands St. Vincent and Dominica. And they uh, also have made a, a slight move of kind of, um, uh, granting some sort of land to the few indigenous people that remain. In the case of Dominica, in fact, both islands are surveyed by these British people to cut up the islands into lots for sale for British sugar planters. And in Dominica, they leave a little corner, which they call uh, the Le Carib for the Carib people. We'll be dealing with that because that is the source, that is the seed for what later becomes the Kalinago territory. Over in St. Vincent, they're leaving a larger area because in the early 18th century, there were eruptions of um, La Soufriere. And so that area becomes not as attractive to the British uh, as, as the Southern parts um, of St. Vincent. And so they are more generous in their grant. They make a larger area of grant in the uh, north of St. Vincent. Um, and this, however, becomes under dispute as the pressure for sugar, uh, less the volcanism declines. And therefore, during the 18th century, it's felt, ah, well, uh, we can uh, take the risk and establish larger plantations, particularly up on the northwest coast of St. Vincent. And we can allow the the Caribs to move uh, further north. But there is also a situation in St. Vincent which is different to that of Dominica, and that is the Garifuna, the Black Caribs. 
They have come in, and that's an entire story which I will not deal with here. That is people of African descent who have come in ships, one initial one, a ship that was supposedly wrecked, and the occupants of that vessel uh, came and established themselves on St. Vincent, taking over the Kalinago way of life and being called the Black Caribs, and uh, also SKPs in boats from Barbados, catching uh, canoes and swiftly going down with the current and landing in St. Vincent. So we have a whole scene there. Uh, where they are taking over and occupying the lands which originally were granted for the Kalinago. The British take umbrage to this. And in 1773, uh, you have the first so-called Carib War. And once again, Agostino Brunias, the Italian artist, is on the scene. His patron, Sir William Young, is sitting down there. Some say it's General Dalrymple. But Young is the one that wants to appear to be the great peacemaker in the first Carib War. And here he is with the Garifuna chiefs and Chief Chateauier. There is the translator, Baptiste, Jean-Baptiste. He's the one uh, to the, um, in the middle, more to in the middle. And then uh, among the British officers, there's one holding the articles of agreement, which indicate also that they must drop their arms and the arms are on the ground uh, representing this. And then over, to the extreme right is the map of St. Vincent, and it's altering the boundaries that are going to be done. This escalates further in the 1790s, and the Garifuna are rounded up. They're put on the little Grenadine Islands of Barriso, and then eventually those that survive are sent to Rautan off the coast of Honduras, and eventually make it to the southern part of Belize. But that is a whole other story but it does impact on the fact that lands that were uh, delineated by the British for the Kalinago people in the north of St. Vincent are then uh, occupied and disputed by the Garifuna people. So in St. Vincent and Dominica, you have the survivors. People are retreating from other islands. They're coming to these um, Kalinago islands, if you will, and um, establishing themselves in small farms on land that is not wanted by the large planter community. And in the case of Dominica, what happens is, although it starts with a very small area of 134 acres at Salibia on the rugged northeast coast that is set aside for the Caribs, they soon realize that this land is not sufficient. The amount, the area is not sufficient for the large numbers that exist. The Kalinagos are settled along the coast of Dominica in any rugged areas that the plantocracy does not want, because what the plantocracy is looking for is wide river valleys for growing sugarcane. So the Kalinagos establish themselves in these little corners, beginning with the corner that the British have allocated for them. By um, 1777, uh, the British realize it's uh, too small and they take over land which they've already sold to British people who do not want this land uh, and they expand it. And so from 1777, they, the Carib Kalinago territory essentially remains the same for uh, another hundred and more years, 130 something years um, until a new pattern, a new policy, a new attitude emerges among the British directorate. And one of the most remarkable people is this guy, the administrator of Dominica, Henry Hesketh Bell, who arrives in 1899 and who is an amateur uh, anthropologist, ethnologist. And he is concerned that, and he writes the colonial offices explaining this, that, that at least after all the region has been taken from them, all the islands have been taken for them, from them, we should at least grant them a, a, a place um, that is more possible for larger agriculture and habitation. But he is also a bit of a racist. He actually um, promotes the Kalinago people above, above the people of African descent. And he makes a 
great point of this and a concern that he does not want the Africans, the post-emancipation people of African descent who need land to be coming and squatting among the Kalinago people. And so he creates out of the original buyer's map, the original colonial map, he creates this area of 3,700 acres on which to establish the largest community of Kalinago people. They're already there. They've already um, established themselves from the time of the Treaty of Paris in 1663, expanded in 1777. And now Bell is going to give them this bigger amount, which he does. And um, one of the main things is to create a boundary against squatting by the African people, people of African descent from the village to the north and the villages to the south. So this is the process that takes place. In the little bright green corner, you have the original um, carib of the map of 1776. Then it is enlarged in 1777. Then Bell gives the reserve of 1903. And then in the 20th century, the Kalinago people essentially take over that white um, block of land, which is part of Concord Estate, an estate owned by British and later on Dominican family. They eventually just claim it as part of the territory. And then they are given 83 acres, which is added in 1996. So by now, the 3,700 acres today is uh, just over 4,000 acres available to them. The church, of course, <laughs> is brought into play, just in a way as at Sotez, you have a situation where the crown then decides to get the church to assist them in their, um, in, in their administration of the Kalinago people. And so they provide 14 acres of land within the original section of 1776. And the church, the Roman Catholic church, uh, became becomes sort of guardians of the Kalinago people. And they build this church in 1919, which has actually slipped down the, the ridge and is all cracked up now. There's a, another church that has uh, replaced it. But the church takes a major part in the uh, activity of the Kalinago after 16, sorry, 1865. And with the establishment of the territory, Hesketh Bell adopts and recreates the whole system of chieftain. So a system of Kalinago chief and councillors is recognized by government from 1903. And now it is entrenched by the Kalinago Territory Act of, eight, of 1978. So here is the first chief on your left and the later chief, uh, Coriette, in 1916, and he's holding a, the staff of office, which has been given by the colonial office in England as a symbol of him as an assistor, a trustee, along with the colonial office. Um, and this develops uh, throughout the 20th century, um, the first two from the first two Kalinago chiefs. And here we have Irvin's Ugist, who you may who you heard a while ago when he was a Kalinago chief during the 1980s. It also has a very nice clear picture of the staff of office, which sadly was lost in 2018. Um, the British crown, and um, it says chief of the Caribs around it. A photograph I took when they had a big Kalinago day back in 1982. Um, there was a great deal of freedom of movement. And one of the problems is that colonial boundaries, we forget about the sea, we think about the land, but those colonial boundaries then delineated how far and where the Kalinago people could go. And up until the 1930s, the Kalinago people just understood they could go to church in Marigalant, they could go and trade down in Martinique, they sold canoe hulls for people up in Guadeloupe, they went to the islands of Les Saints freely. They worked sometimes in the early 20th century on the sugarcane fields of both Guadeloupe and Martinique. There was this freedom of movement. But then the British decided to institute uh, the 
formalize the boundaries. And they were concerned about the Kalinago people bringing rum and other stuff from the French islands without paying duty. And this was the first salvo of the 1930s troubles in the British West Indies, which came from the Kalinago territory on the 19th of September, 1930, over conditions of poverty and freedom of movement. And then later in the 1930s, we get all the reports of riots and strikes up and down the islands from Jamaica, St. Vincent, St. Kitts, uh, Barbados, of course, in the oil fields of Trinidad. All of this is emerging And what does the British do? In every case, they send a, a frigate or a destroyer to either blow bombs, bring Marines, or as in the case of the Kalinago people, fire star shells at night to terrify them. So just as today we are observing the 30th of May, uh, 1650, the Kalinago people in Dominica, their Kalinago day is on the 19th of September, and there's a whole Kalinago week associated with it. And uh, the Moyne Commission, which was investigating conditions in the West Indies, uh, was um, they visited the territory and they were petitioned by these gentlemen who were part of the council. The guy on the extreme uh, left is uh, the current, uh, was the chief at the time. But the problem was that, and this is, is, is a longer story, involving the uh, Carib uprising, the Kalinago uprising in 1930, when they had basically taken the chief's staff and his sash away, and they had abolished the chieftaincy. Uh, so this guy is standing in for the chief, because the Kalinago people didn't pay any attention to what the British had imposed. Uh, and back in 1952, they got back their chief and their staff, etc. So it's quite an involved story, but it shows that here is a period now of serious negotiation about what the future of the Kalinago people is going to be. And as we move into the late 20th century, people like Irving Sugist and others begin, influenced of course, by what's going on in, in the First Nations, the Native American people and others, both in South and North America, to start a, a cultural movement, a complete revolution of what it is to be an indigenous person at this time. And so we get an intensification of Kalinago pride, of a reinvention of culture, self-identity, and of course linked to such things as tourism and information related to the natural uh, herbs and plants uh, of Dominica. And so today, just before independence in 1978, the Kalinago people demanded of the British government and the Dominica government, you cannot send us into independence without ensuring that there is an act, there is a piece of legislation which is going to protect our territory and protect us. And we are going to stand up against independence if this is not granted. And so in throughout the period of 1977 and into 1978, they, what was called at the time the Carib Reserve Act was initiated. So there's an election for the chief every five years, election for councillors every three years. There are regulations related to the duties and powers of uh, those officers. And also since 1974, a representative of the Kalinago territory. And usually the representative of the Kalinago territory is made a minister of Kalinago affairs. But for the first time at the last election in 2019, it's not just Kalinago affairs that the Kalinago representative um, administers. He has now been given other ministries, ministries of environment and um, other aspects of forestry and national parks have been handed over to the Kalinago representative. So uh, just to compact this, uh, we have a, a revival, a reinterest, a dynamism that has emerged within the territory. And its headquarters, if you wish, is in this Kalinago Barana Ote, the Kalinago Village by the Sea, which is an open museum and cultural village in the Kalinago territory. The interest in things such as archaeology, assisted by um, 
the University in the Netherlands in Leiden and by the um, University Anti, as well as other universities. They, they, they are very active. So it's a success story in a way. And I'd like to thank you for listening and um, adding your awareness of this important development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Honeychurch. And if you're wondering why you were so captivated by that presentation and didn't want to leave your seats, Dr. Honeychurch is very much a stalwart of Caribbean history. If you've done any Caribbean history, you, you, you're familiar with his work. And um, just to comment a, a little bit on the presentation, Okay, I'm going to ask you to just mute your mics, please. Those of you who are not present, thank you very much. Just a little commentary on the presentation. I could not help but notice as a social scientist myself, how Dr. Honeychurch's presentation encapsulated the processes of coloniality that are always founded in a logic of dispossession. So we see over time how our Kalinago ancestors were um, dispossessed, uh, placed in reserves, uh, given land, land taken away from them, uh, and so on and so forth. And we see that processes of coloniality persist even to this day when we're talking about the, Car the, the Caribs so-called of Grenada, for example, that are uh, gone, they're gone from, from uh, Grenada, they're extinct as far as everyone is concerned in Grenada. However, uh, as a result of these, these colonial processes, we find uh, these synergies around the world where indigenous peoples came in contact with Europeans. We have these very similar processes emerging even in Canada in the last couple of days this history emerging of, of indigenous children who will, again, we see the collaboration between the church and state, which is very much a feature of, of colonial, uh, colonial logics and colonial government, where the Catholic church um, took these children into the quote unquote care. And now we're uncovering uh, huge uh, burial grounds of, of um, hundreds of children who, were um, neglected and, and died uh, at the hands of the Catholic Church. So we see that our presenters' point, points are very well uh, taken when they, they say that these, our history is our future and that coloniality is with us. We still live through those colonial processes, these things that, uh, that dispossess that the, the, it's amazing to think that in 1650, the genocidal logics of colonialism are still to be found on, in burial grounds in Canada in 2021. So we praise the spirit of our ancestors and the, the resistance and the preservation. We look at the fact that there is a Kalinago cultural village in Dominica as a success story, as a, a story of persistence and resistance. And, um, and we take a lot of, of pride in that. And, and we hope that this work is the beginning of, of a groundswell of interest and research that is bound up within these, uh, these politics of resistance and, um, and reparations and reparatory justice. So thank you again. Uh, Dr. Honeychurch for that very stirring, very stirring presentations. We collectively decided that we would just wanted to listen to you uh, for the rest of the evening if we could. So we're just so happy that, that you were here with us this evening to share. At this time, it's uh, my pleasure to read to you a message from the president of the Garifuna Nation, Mr. Egbert R. Higinio. He was awarded an MA degree in philosophy from San Jose State University in San Jose, California, and a Bachelor of Arts degree in comparative literature from the University of Belize. He has been active in indigenous people's struggle from the 1980s, as in the National Garifuna Council, 
Central American Black Organization, the Society for the Promotion of Education and Research, and many other grassroots trade union and youth movements. He's a part-time adjunct lecturer and teaches philosophy, literature, English composition and logic at Merritt College, Oakland, and Evergreen Valley College in San Jose, both in California. Egbert presently holds the office of president of the Garifuna Nation, a regional advocacy organization for all Garifuna people. And I just, I very confidently said that I have, there you go. On behalf of the Garifuna Nation, that, I wish to- I'd like to just um, correct that um, is the pronunciation is Eugenio, the H is silent, the G is like an H, okay? Wonderful, Eugenio. thank you very much for that, okay. Eugenio. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. On behalf of the Garifuna Nation, I wish to send our solidarity to you and your memorializing May 30th, when in 1650, that is 371 years ago, your indigenous people witnessed and suffered from European invasion. On another island, another group of people, the Garifuna or so-called Black Caribs of St. Vincent and the Grenadines had similar encounters. My ancestors suffered at the ruthless invasions of the Spanish, the French and the British. Subsequently, our land was stolen and our great leader, Joseph Chatoya, and many others were murdered. Indeed, after 30 years war with the British, our history documents that a large group of our people experienced genocide in April 1796, when approximately 2,500 were placed on, on a barren island off of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to die from lack of food and water. Another group of 2,500 were forcibly relocated to Honduras, where they were to be used as cannon fodder by the British who were in military conflict with the Spanish over colonies. From Rotan in Honduras, our Garifuna people continued to seek freedom and therefore moved to Guatemala, Nicaragua and Belize seeking better living conditions. At the moment, we are approximately 800,000 strong in Central America and the United States of America. Yes, the atrocities of Europe's colonial projects are nothing new to us. Eurocentrism has taught nothing that is strange. We are familiar with the present trajectory of racism. Our ancestors' early experience with the phenomena of colonialism's expansion and domination is emblematic of the Europeans' heart of darkness and their fixation on disrespecting Afro-descendants and our indigenous peoples. This early manifestation of racism is becoming blatant and possess pervasive in our present day reality, as though it would be the continuum of European theory and practices of development. We are in solidarity with you, Grenada, brothers and sisters, because the deterritorialization of our people, the dysfunctional socioeconomic institutions we have inherited have direct links to Europe's colonial projects, Europe's logos, pathos, and ethos. Indeed, its telos was focused on the total annihilation of our ancestors. Indeed, Europe has taught us much about its inhumanity. However, today, May 30th, we are in solidarity with you. We descendants of these indigenous lands cannot despair. What was stolen and damaged must be returned and repaired. Though we are living in separate islands and though our people have experienced atrocities, we believe and know that our indigenous people's culture will be a gift to humanity. Though there appears to be a permanence of Europe's racism and this phenomenal to mother earth, we indigenous peoples share the commonality of an island narrative that discloses how Europeans brawn must now give account to our indigenous Caribbean brains, a gift to all humanity, for we are in solidarity with you, Grenada. Thank you very much for that message from Mr. Egbert Higinio. Thank you. Thank you too, Tesla. Thank you for inviting us. This is very, very wonderful. And I, I, I think we need to store this rich information you're sharing with us. It's, uh, it moves me very much. And my brothers are here. 
to say something later and we might want to ask some questions later too, especially to Brother Lennox and the previous presenters. Wonderful. Well, we are moving right along into that portion of the program where we get to ask questions. I would ask you to pose your questions in the chat or if you really feel very strongly about uh, coming on, on camera, then maybe we can uh, have that. Oh, we could ask questions mm -hmm. now? Absolutely, we're moving into the, the yeah, question my, my, answer. Yeah, question. my first question is uh, to brother, um, the Professor Anichurch. Um, in his uh, reading and, and uh, research um, and, and findings, um, have, has he um, noticed, for example, uh, a reluctance to refer to uh, the Garifna experience in St. Vincent? Um, is there a reluctance to use the word, uh, the experience of genocide? Because it's only recent that I've been using it. Um, and there's, I've noticed um, in certain quarters of my community, Belize and uh, Honduras, we refer to that experience as an exile, as a deportation, rather than uh, it was genocide. 2,500 people were literally left to die. Uh, yes, it is actually something that has been more recently uh, um, accepted and used. That, that sort of language, of course, during the colonial period was never used. The whole question of them being taken out on these islands and left, many of them thousand of, to die, um, was more or less hidden. There was just this story of, okay, they had this war, uh, the British decided to ship them across to Rautan and then further on, and that was the end of the story. And it's only within uh, recent times, and I would say, even within the 21st century, the last 20, 21 years, that we have got a more general acceptance of the fact that this would be classed as a form of, uh, of genocide. So it is really a very recent um, use of the word and a, a more recent realization. Because what happened on um, Baliso and Batiwa uh, was not was not investigated, yes. was not talked about very much, you know, um, mm -hmm. and the information has only just recently been coming in. Of course, it is assisted by the fact that, um, that in the case of the reparation committees, which have been set up by CARICOM, mm -hmm. uh, the, that is part of it. As I say, in my position as a member of the reparation committee in Dominica, which in, includes uh, unlike some other islands, it includes the whole Kalinago story as well. Mm -hmm. I say it is a court case. Good. What we're dealing with, yes, you have, you know, an emotional description of it. You, you get annoyed, you get vexed or whatever. But it is a court case in the last analysis. You are presenting evidence. And mm -hmm. therefore, what we have got to do and what I've already done for, for the committee is all the questions to do with the treaties, all the questions to do with the land that had been um, appropriated, the broken treaties and everything. All of these things are listed as concrete examples of, of transgressions that have to be compensated for in, in one way or another. Thank you, Brother Lennox. Yes. Um, yeah, we, will, uh, we want to follow up because uh, uh, my brothers are here, Brother Wellington, who's a vice president um, and Joe Guerrero, uh, Joseph Guerrero, who, uh, as part of the Garifuna Nation, we have delegated, appointed him, assigned to him uh, to be Minister of Lands, so to look after all the lands uh, in terms of you know numbers and acres that was stolen. Um, and Brad, Brad Ellington, uh, he's a professor of history, so this this conference is very valuable for him. Uh, I'm more a philosopher of literature, and I you know look at some of the philologies and so on. In terms of uh, the CARICOM reparations, we would want to have you know, a, a seat in the Garifuna Nation, because I think that apart from slavery, right, there was slavery, and, but ours was more like a, a, a sort of deterritorialization and genocide, you know, which is separate. 
And so that's, that would be uh, uh, one of our struggles to get on the CARICOM Reparations Committee as a, as a people beyond borders, because we are not confined to just one country. We, we have several countries we are representing. But I was just wondering, does, does Belize include specifically Garifuna on their sort of um, label, their itemization of what the Reparations Committee of Belize is, they, is involved in? We have understand that they have been decommissioned. Okay. And I could, I could give you a long story about, you know, the, 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 Af- the descendants of slavery and the Garifuna have been to one or two meetings and they have been decommissioned by the government of Belize. Okay. And so we have decided that we might have to find a way out of that uh, debacle. Yeah, because in Dominica, Kalinago is specifically included in the okay. title of the committee and Very also good. in the representation of the people who are on the committee, you know? Yeah, I find this work very valuable as I, as uh, you know, we I haven't been to St. Vincent. Some of my brothers have been, um, especially with the uh, hieroglyphics. They, no, I say, I keep saying hieroglyphics, the petroglyphs, the petroglyphs um, that I noticed was in that, in that, uh, in the map that was presented, I think by Jonathan. Yeah, I think it was Jonathan, right? Um, and I, I, I have an interest in that because the history in Belize, we had never taught this history. We don't know anything, right? All we hear, like this, the other sister was saying, oh, we are a bunch of cannibals and, and, and we're stupid, Garifuna, Caribs, you know, and we're dark and nothing about this uh, entry that we were developing our own civilization. And I, apparently the petroglyphs was evidence that our people were highly sophisticated. And, and so this is something that we, I, I would, like to be involved with. And Thank another thing. you. Sorry. I'm just I'm just going to to act in my role as moderator okay, here and say fine. I hate to I hate to uh, interrupt this very very exciting exchange and this is precisely the kind of 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 very generative conversation we want to emerge out of this exchange but we do have a little bit of a time constraint so I'm going to encourage um Dr. Honeychurch and uh, Brother Ihinio mm-hmm. to be in touch and to keep yes, this I conversation will. going. And that, that is something that we together as a committee hope to, to be able to do as well. We have a couple of other questions that uh, my co-moderator will. Uh, I see a question and I hope I pronounced her name correctly, Tala. And there's three questions in, in the chat. The first is for, uh, uh, for Angus, but he or she says, thank you so much for this excellent presentation. I have a question for Angus. The question to Angus, is there any evidence of mass suicide or is this a simply misinterpretation by early historians? I would wait until Angus has answer, then I'll go to the question that concerns Jonathan and then Dr. Honeychurch. I think, um... Based on the based on the information that we had in the beginning, I think people drew conclusions. Now we're beginning to, to get much more of the information, and that's why I would call it a massacre or ambush. You know, I think when we what we know of uh, Kalinago society in the sense that when they got together to drink and things like that and to have a festive, you know, um, event, I think we 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 probably will come up with with a different um, conclusion. I, I, I would not characterize it as a suicide. I think in when we look at the way the event happened in the evening, in the late evening, it was dark. You know, um, people are ambushed. And I think um, they were forced to, to run away from being killed. And um, they were really no, they were cornered. And the only place that could, they could have gone was over the cliff. Um, was that a choice? Um, that is something I don't think we can determine. You know, I think we can know what we can look at the situations, you know, that contributed to it, but we cannot, the final decision would have been up to them, you know, do they battle back or do they jump or, you know, so I think that is left up to interpretation. And I think we can choose to, to, to determine how we, we um, present that information and draw that conclusion. I, I just wondered whether or not the reason I'm asking is because I just wondered if there had been any other instances 
that um, where there had been a mass suicide. You know how things sometimes stories can get confused or whether or not this, just this one particular incident, we're very clear about that, that you've identified this other source that, and it seems very unlikely that it was a mass suicide as it's been quite poetically portrayed in yes. the past. But, um, but I wondered if there, you know, if that had happened somewhere else and that's, that's how the confusion had happened. I was just, just interested in that. Um, we know there are a number of these events that take place throughout the Les Antilles. Uh, but also in, 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 it, it's, it's more of a massacre type than people choosing. You know, I think when we do what we do know about the, the Kalinago, they fought back. You know, so yeah. the idea of a suicide is definitely seems anatomy to the, the, the way they, they function in, in relation to um, their struggles against Europeans. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, second question, uh, it goes to Dr. Hannah. Uh, I really think that the citizen scientist is an amazing idea. Have you got any information that you can share? Um, may want to clarify, please, it's about the citizenship idea. Jonathan, maybe you understand more. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, the more to come with that um, once we get the projects, this UNESCO project uh, up and running. Um, I have a website, grenadaarchaeology.com. We'll probably put a lot of GPN stuff off of that. Um, but I just have to redo that site. So there'll be more there and uh, we'll do some, some more press releases and things once, once it, uh, it happens. If you're interested um, in participating, especially if you're up, if you're up in St. Patrick's, um, you could drop us a line um, or my, my email is jhanna at museum.gd. You're welcome to email me about that. Can I also make a comment? Um, Kellen Bubba just mentioned, um, you know, uh, a similar thing to what Angus had mentioned in his talk about the appropriate symbol uh, versus what's on Carib Sleep right now. And um, to um, uh, Hinio's uh, comment about the petroglyphs, maybe something like some sort of petroglyph, especially something maybe from Mount Rich or one of these other sites where we do have indigenous symbols that might be more appropriate than what's what's there, but something to discuss. <laughs> okay, and the final question from that, um, from Talia is, Dr. Honeychurch, can you please recommend an introductory source about the Garifuna and the history that you alluded to? Um, there's so much scattered about, uh, but to get a kind of argumentative source, there's this book from 1985 called Myths of a Minority. Um, and it's related specifically to St. Vincent. It's written by somebody called C.J. Gullick. And it is a sort of, um, a, a sort of, it essentially the challenging traditions. It, it has a subtitle challenging traditions of the St. Vincent Caribs. Um, and it gives you at least the pros and the cons of this situation. But then another um, more recent work is something called the new, the, the new Map of Empire. And it's all about lands being partitioned off while the, the British Empire is being created. Um, both in North America and in the Caribbean for indigenous, indigenous people. So um, that's one of them. It's the new map of empire and it is um, by, edited by Max Edelson, Harvard University Press, and that's from 2017. So you have a far more recent uh, thing, but then of course you've got all the British documentation in the British archives, the mm -hmm. governors and whatever, and then also you get the colonialist point of view in Brian Edwards' history of uh, the English people in the Caribbean, and um, and particularly works by Sir William Young Jr. because he has land in Saint Vincent, and he is 
totally concerned and consumed with all of this, but you're getting from him a, a colonial perspective, but he's giving you quite a lot of detail, although it's from his point of view, because he owns land within that area. So, so there are documents that you can refer to. Okay, all right, thank you. Is there any way that you could give all of those sources to test better email to me? So, I could, so I'm trying to type them into my phone as you're speaking. And That's I'm okay, ready. well, I did, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't quite know how this operates, but in the chat list, Mm -hmm. I did. I did put my email there. Oh, I, fantastic! Uh, you'll okay. see. I actually address it to um, Egbert uh, Eugenio, but it's there. You may contact me at lennoxh52 at gmail dot com. But it's written in. Just yeah, sorry. thank you. Just, yes, yeah, thank just you. skim through. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for all of your questions. Thank you to. Uh, our very, very interested and participatory audience. We are so um, sad to <laughs> have come to the portion of this afternoon where we have to close off. And um, we, we did our best. We're, we're half hour uh, beyond where we, we thought we would be at this time. Uh, before we uh, officially close off, we have a charge from one of the members of our panel, uh, Angus Martin. And what I would like to, to suggest is that we actually look at creating sites of conscience across the, the Lesser Antilles for these known sites. I know we would require to do some research on some of these similar to Sotez, um, but it's a way we do not have any sites of conscience across the Caribbean as yet. Um, and I think it's something that we should actually look into act to, to do in and, and setting this up and, and bringing this to the forefront, you know, the whole idea of what was done to the indigenous people of the Caribbean islands, specifically here, the Les Antilles. So I am hoping that other people are interested in this and some of these other islands that we may contact uh, with individuals. I know I've spoken to um, Vince in, in Dominique already and told him that this is something that we would like to do. And I would definitely like to get some uh, more people uh, interested, if interested in this, to get this done. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Angus. So Wellington, go ahead. Go ahead, Wellington. Um, my name is Wellington Ramos. I'm a Caribbean from Belize. I'm also the first vice president for the Caribbean Nation in the United States. One of the biggest problems we have is that in most of the countries where we live, the governments are also violating the rights of the indigenous people. So if they are violating the indigenous people's rights, we cannot depend on them to bring no case on our behalf because they're not gonna do it. Thank you very much uh, for that point, Mr. Ramos. We are moving to uh, close the session. So. And our closing uh, remarks will be by Mrs. Retisha Boyd. And she's a Grenadian from the town of St. George and uh, the general manager of the Grenada Credit Union. Apart from a business document, she's a passionate about governance, youth and education. She also serves or served on various management committees in the corporate movement cooperative movement, sorry. 
She's also an, an, an accredited director with the Chartered Governance Institute, which is the global governance body geared towards leading effective and efficient government governance and administration of commerce, industry, and public affairs. She has a financial literacy, she is has been a financial literacy trainer within the Commonwealth Secretariat and a teacher. She has a certificate in education from the University of the West Indies a bachelor's degree in business administration and a master's degree in international business from the University of North Alabama. Uh, Mrs. Richisha Boyd for our closing remarks. Thank you, Lorna Dale. Good evening to everyone. As we bring to a close our 2021 Indigenous Peoples Heritage Virtual Education Forum, I trust that all of us participants, audience, pre presenters, we would have been edified, enlightened, and encouraged to further the cause of protecting our indigenous people, history, and culture, which is by extension a part of our history and culture. This session to me has been a powerhouse, very rich in information um, and education, and I hope will spur persons on this uh, forum to action. Now, the goal of this forum is to engage the students, youth, and the public to contribute to the consciousness and safeguarding of those heritage, but to increase historical awareness, protection of indigenous people heritage locally and in the wider Caribbean, and to build community and national support uh, for the declaration of May 30th as a National Indigenous Peoples Day, as a memorial and remem remembrance. And I trust that, um, and I believe that you know, these goals were achieved and of course will spur even future action um, from those who are on the call and by sharing the information that you would have uh, heard today the only way we could dispel the myth, the only way we could dispel on truth is by sharing the truth. And from our presenters uh, this afternoon, I'm sure many of us on the call would have been enlightened to truths that we would not have known or may not have known. You know, there is this popular saying that, of course, the history is written by the victors. And, uh, when we look at the indigenous peoples in Grenada and across the Caribbean, we know that there are so much falsehoods that we may have been taught growing up or that we would have learned, of course, because they weren't the ones telling their own truths. And the presenters this afternoon really did a marvelous job of telling the truths that we needed to hear. And I trust that these truths will continue not just in this forum, but will be shared. So if each one of us here shares what we would have learned with someone who was not on this call, imagine um, what can be done. Angus Martin's presentation on myth, truth, and legacy really helped us um, do some introspection in terms of what we think we know um, and challenge some of that. It may have made some persons uncomfortable because of what you, you may have held dear for so long. But I think uh, Angus, your presentation really was uh, a myth buster um, because it really dispelled you know, some of the things, some of what is popular, but not what is true. Your storytelling was very riveting. Um, that storytelling around the events at Leapers Hill. Even though we are not quite sure it actually occurred there, but you know, the whole event of May 30th, you provided more clarity on the event and even your information on the writings of uh, Bresson provided you know, more light on what would have happened such as you know, the correct date um, of the event. So thank you very much, Angus. 
one of your one of the phrases um, during your presentation that I really want to highlight again spoke of uh, the Kalinago, the stories, and the stories are the roots to our branches, the earth from which our stories rise. If it's the roots to our branches, it means that it is part of us. We cannot exist without it. And to deny it would be denying part of ourselves. Um, you mentioned some of the examples of Kalinago history and culture that still exist with us today in terms of um, the names of locations, fruits and vegetables. And these are haunting tales of the lives of the indigenous persons that we wish we would have known. And we are now learning and knowing about the agricultural methods, the fishing, the processing of cassava um, is evident really of the lifestyle of our indigenous ancestors, which we have embraced, but not fully being aware of the significance behind it. And uh, your presentation really um, spoke to that. So thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Hanna, your presentation on the, you know, the archaeological heritage of Sotez Bay was also very riveting. Those um, carbon data really proved that our ancestors were here centuries before they were acknowledged. And the whole idea of preserving our heritage and the threats surrounding our heritage, um, the environmental uh, threats that are affecting Sotez Bay. Also, you know, the uh, human threats as well. I think this is an opportunity for all of us to lend our community support um, to preserving what we have, because when it's gone, it's gone. We cannot get it back. Um, the whole example of the breakwater and how it would have, you know, exacerbated uh, some of the issues along the coastline, destroying Amerindian uh, burial sites. Um, I think, you know, we really need to get more community support, governmental support, lobbying, petitioning, um, because this is part of our heritage. And thank you so much for um, shining a light on what is happening um, at that area. You know, a lot of times we may think that archaeology is just, you know, digging up some bones and looking at what's happening in the past, but it, it, it is actually um, a living science. And so to have uh, the community involved, um, as you would have identified, you know, with your community projects and support, um, I think that is so important because the community in a heritage site really are the gatekeepers. The archaeologists cannot do it alone. If the community is involved and they are the ones supporting, they are the ones appreciating the importance of these archaeological sites and, and they are the ones appreciating the importance of, of heritage, um, then I think you, you would get even more support. So kudos for you, you and your team in including you know, the community in the work that you do. Uh, Dr. Honeychurch. This is a full circle moment for me um, because you would have grown up reading your history books and your textbooks and so forth. And to have you here you now presenting, um, I know uh, Lana Dale and Tesfa can, can you know, um, support me in this, that you, you see authors, you read the information and then they become alive. So I am, I am very uh, happy to be in the presence of, um, you know, these three luminaries um, that have done such great work in preserving our heritage. Uh, Dr. Honeychurch, in your presentation, you know, you really looked at um, the example of uh, how we could maintain 
indigenous people's culture and as well how that culture um, and the islands may have been lost. Uh, you looked at the struggle of the indigenous people, um, the balance between trade and survival, something that is still relevant with us even today in terms of um, protecting ourselves and uh, protecting our families. Um, in terms of uh, the Dominica example, which is seen as you know, somewhat of a model for success, I note that in Dominica, there is the Kalanago um, Act that helps govern what happens. I think we can learn from that. What can we do in Grenada and in other territories um, to get you know, that kind of governmental support to protect the indigenous uh, people? And definitely we cannot do it alone. It, it has to be a, um, um, a regional action uh, as well. We had some messages from um, some very esteemed persons and we, we wanna thank them for that. We wanna thank, that, thank them for that. Dr. Nicole Philip Dow, um, who is the head of the UE Open Campus. In Dr. Dow's uh, remarks, she made a comment that I really want to uh, highlight. And in her comment, she said that the Amerindians have a symbiotic relationship with the land. And when we look at symbiotic, we're looking at mutually beneficial. And that I think is something that is so relevant to us, especially at a time now in, you know, in the world where we see that our earth is dying. And that, and that there, there, you know, there are so many different environmental crises going on. This is something I think that we can learn and model from, that we can have even today a symbiotic relationship um, with our environment, with, our, with nature, and that we celebrate the, the legacy of the indigenous person. So thank you so much, Dr. Dow, um, for your words of uh, um, solidarity. Ambassador Gill, thank you so much for your, your good wishes. And I note that you stated that the first step towards reclaiming and amplifying history and heritage is officially recognizing and remembering the 30th me as Monday Sotez, as Remembrance Day, and Indigenous Peoples Day. And you, you are uh, so right. We need to be able um, to memorialize this day make it and make it official. And you showed the correlation between the descendants of slaves and the indigenous persons um, and to engage them in, in, in our struggle for reparation. Thank you so much, Sherman, for your, your solidarity. We had messages from Representative August of the Kalinago community in Dominica. And you highlighted in your message that the key to the development of the indigenous people really is a regional network. And I think that was one of, you know, some, one of the pivotal points through the whole presentation that we cannot do this alone. Um, the organizations and the indigenous descendants throughout the region really must work together um, as a common network to support and strengthen advocacy to protect our indigenous peoples and culture. So thank you for your support. And our last message came from Egbert Ihinio, I hope I pronounced that correct, from the Karifuna people. And also you would have identified, you know, the similarities in the struggle between the Karafuna and the indigenous persons. And that struggle is one of the commonalities that binds, you know, the various indigenous persons because they are able to understand um, from the belly of the beast really, what it takes really to survive um, a massacre, what it takes really to survive um, 
the, that whole colonization of your, of your people, of your home. And we thank you, sir, for your solidarity with us. This evening's um, session, I can't say it enough, has been you know, such a powerhouse um, presentation. I hope that everybody on this call really will do some introspection and look at what can I do? Coming out of this session, what can I do? Um, I want to also thank the moderators, Tesfa and Lana Dale. Um, ladies, you did a very impressive job um, directing the focus of the discussion throughout this whole afternoon. And Tesfa, your introduction on the, your, your adaptation in your introduction really set the tone for the remainder of the session. You may have to share that with me afterwards, right, Tef Tesfa? Um, but it really, it really set the tone for the remainder of our event this afternoon. So as I leave this with you, because I've been talking for a while, I'm going to end now. As we, as we close, I want all of us to think about what can I do? What can I do? I've heard a lot. Um, does it stay with me? What can I do? To further the protection, the development, the safeguarding, the awareness of indigenous peoples and their culture. What can I do to protect? What can I do to educate? What can I do to lobby the authorities to make certain changes that is necessary? What can I do to dispel the myths that have been floating around um, in our societies? How can I share? the truth? And the answers to these questions would be different for every one of us, but all of us can be part of the change that is needed. So let's continue that whole discussion um, about memorializing May 30th. Let's continue doing what we can in our own small corner of the globe to protect our indigenous peoples. And before I leave, I wanna say a special, special thank you to the conveners of this afternoon's event, the Indigenous Peoples Heritage Support Organization and the IPE Dare to Understand Enlightenment series in collaboration with the UE Open Campus. Thank you very much for seeing the importance of this forum and also special thanks to TNR Communications for the technical support. So as we leave this afternoon, and as we prepare for our next forum, which will be, I would say bigger and better. I don't know how, how it can top this, but I'm sure it will. Um, let us all have one takeaway and let us all give our commitment to do one thing that would make the preservation of our indigenous people's heritage and culture better. For when we know better, we need to do better. So thank you very much and have a good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to go to the